Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where Karen gets left out in the rain. Our next Reddit post is from I'm JJ as me. I was working at a restaurant waiting tables in a very affluent area on the Jersey Shore. We had our fair share of entitled people who were under the impression that if you throw enough money around, you can do whatever you want and treat people however you want. And when your income depends on their tips, you kind of have to just deal with it. The restaurant had an outdoor dining and bar area that overlooked the ocean with an amazing view. During the summer, this was pretty much where everyone wanted to sit rather than in our indoor dining area. And for anyone who works someplace with outdoor dining, you know the one monkey wrench that can ruin a very profitable dinner shift. The weather. No matter how accurate the forecast says it's going to be, you can never know for sure. For the most part, we never had an issue, because if it started to abruptly rain, there would usually be more than enough room inside for all the people who were sitting outside to move. It's usually a mess to keep track of which table moved where, but we always handled it without any issue. Until that one day. We had a large party that booked our indoor area and took up half our tables. It was a 50th birthday party, I believe. So, our indoor capacity was limited. And even on top of the party, there were customers who were wary about the weather, so they decided to sit inside also. And then, more and more people started sitting outside. My manager did a quick assessment and realized that if it started raining, we would barely have enough room inside to accommodate everyone who was sitting outside. He told us that we had to stop seating our outdoor area and to start recommending to our outdoor tables that they might want to move inside because of the impending weather. Everyone's weather app was saying that there was a downpour coming up the coast. All the customers were okay with this, except I had a table of nine people who seemed fairly middle-aged and very wealthy. They ordered margaritas with top shelf tequila, they had gaudy looking jewelry, etc. Each end of the table seemed to have their own conversation, not paying attention to the other end of the table. Upon hearing about the incoming rain, I went to the woman who I thought was in charge because she had the fakest tan of them all. I told her, ma'am, I'm really sorry, but because of the weather coming in and our limited seating inside, I'm going to have to move you folks inside so you don't get caught in the rain. This Karen is so entrenched in her conversation that she doesn't even register that I, a lowly waiter, was talking to her. So I tried again. Ma'am, I'm sorry for interrupting, but... She cuts me off, exasperated. What? What are you saying? I begin again. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but because of the incoming weather and our indoors filling up, we need to move you inside. We have a table ready for you, and I can move all your drinks and everything for you. She snaps back with, The only reason we came here was to sit outside, so we'll deal with the weather. I realize that she doesn't grasp what I'm saying, so I try again. Ma'am, just in case the... Then she goes from 0 to 100 and yells at me, We will effing deal with it! She yelled so loudly that the people on the other half of the table turned to listen. They didn't hear our prior exchange, but only heard her outburst and then went back to their conversation. Because I guess this must be normal behavior for her. She wants to deal with the weather on her own? You got it! Filet mignon, a few lobster tails, expensive stuff. I put the order in, I look back, and all the other tables had moved inside. Because they were all rational human beings, and my table of nine entitled jerks were the only ones still out there. I heard the leathery looking Karen say to the rest of the table, Wow, we have the entire patio to ourselves, what luxury. After a while, I looked inside, and I saw the table that I'd held for them was taken by another party that had just walked in. This was the last available table. And just as the last butt hit the seat, I felt the best feeling I could possibly have at that moment. A glorious raindrop tapped on the top of my head. Oh, sweet glory. Within seconds, it went from beautiful blue skies to torrential downpour. Everyone at the table grabbed their drinks, which were a little watered down at this point, and ran inside. After they shook themselves dry, they looked around and realized there was nowhere for them to sit. Most of them looked dumbfounded, like a lost child in a supermarket. Karen made a beeline to me and screamed, We need a table! I replied, I'm sorry ma'am, but we're fully seated and we have a wait list for indoor seating. Well, what are we supposed to do now? She hawked back at me, which led to me so eloquently saying, Ma'am, as you said you would, you effing deal with it. 
I air quoted the effing deal with it to really emphasize that this was her response. And when I said that, everyone else at their table realized that that was our interaction earlier and that Karen had dug their own graves. I felt bad for most of them because if they had all known the circumstances, they would have probably convinced Karen to move. But after she raised her voice and cursed at me, all bets were off. And as serendipity would have it, at that exact moment, their food came out and we handed it to them. There they were, nine people in damp clothes holding a Cosmo in one hand and filet mignon in the other with nowhere to sit to eat. The rest of her party convinced her just to get some boxes for their food, pay their check, and leave. As I hand Karen the check, she smugly says, Well, this'll be reflected in your tip. To which I replied, Ma'am, we implement a 20% tip on parties of eight or more. It's our policy, and it's clearly stated in our menu. She paid, and then they left with their boxed up food, leaving behind their half full drinks. It was the best 60 bucks that I ever made. Our next Reddit post is from OK Eggplant. I work in IT, and I've been working with my current company for close to two years. I started in one of the lowest positions available, but I slowly took on more responsibility as my IT directors were repeatedly fired by upper management. In my short time at this company, I've had four managers, a new CTO, five of my colleagues be fired, and a network breach by Russians. And never once have I been given praise or compensation for mitigating these crises. In this time, I've made efforts to improve the company's systems, and I've spent hundreds of hours automating several tasks, which have saved the IT department about 80 hours of work a week. My goal was to get promoted, because I was doing the work of someone in a much higher position than me. Earlier in the year, I asked my boss for additional training and a raise. He said that he had to wait till the yearly performance review for me to receive a raise, but that he would give me some training with infrastructure techs to further my career. Months pass, and I am barely included on email threads, which is his form of training. My yearly review comes, and I ask my boss for the promised raise and promotion. He says that I don't have training, and I would need a specific certification that he has, which is notoriously difficult to obtain. Our chief technology officer was also in my performance review, and he agreed with my boss that the certification was needed to advance. This was the first time that I was told this, and I left the meeting infuriated. I got out of work at 5pm, immediately searched for a question dump for the certification, and studied the questions till about 4am. I scheduled the certification test for 6am, and barely passed. I walked into work, placed the certification on my manager's desk, and asked for a raise again. His look of disbelief gave me so much joy. He still argued against a raise, but I took it to the CTO and he told the manager to give me my promotion. This happened a couple of days ago, and I'm still riding the high. Our next Reddit post is from Millie Barnes. This happened a long time ago, but it still tickles me. The year was 1971, and I got married for the first time. Things were a lot different back then for women. We had just gotten married the day before, and the next morning, my husband woke up and told me he wanted cabbage, sausage, and potatoes for dinner. At this point, I had never eaten sausage in my life, and I was never going to, and strangely enough, I had never had cabbage either. I told him I didn't eat those things, and he simply told me that that's what I was fixing. So I unpacked the new pots and pans. I put the biggest pot we had on the stove, added water, cabbage, potatoes, and seasoning. I turned it on high with everything inside the pot, which was Teflon. I burned it to a crisp, and I still left it there to completely ruin the pot. When my husband got home, I told him that, going forward, I would be cooking dinners that we could both eat. Because we've been dating for almost three years, and I clearly knew what kinds of foods that we both liked. He was seriously mad. I calmly stuck to my guns and told him he wasn't going to bully me, and just because we were married doesn't mean that he got to tell me what to do. That marriage lasted a year and a half. I couldn't wait to get away. Our next Reddit post is from Jackie Sparrow. My job starts at about 2pm. Usually that means I wake up at about 9 in the morning. A few weeks back, I woke up at 9 o'clock feeling sick, dizzy, and throwing up. I went to bed fine the day before. I called work at around 10am and said that I couldn't come in. My manager is immediately like, Our policy is to call in sick before 6am, so you won't get your hours. My manager arrives at the building at around 10am, so it would have been impossible to call before 6. Anyways, we also have to call daily to let them know if we're going to come in or if we're sick. 
The next morning, at around 5 a.m., I wake up and call my work. No answer. Duh, because no one's there yet. So, I decide to call the manager directly. She answers the phone and groggily says, What? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I'm still sick. Couldn't you have done that last night? Yeah, but I could have been better this morning. The next two days, I do the exact same thing. She then sends me an email explaining how the rules have been changed and calling at 10 a.m. is now acceptable. Our next Reddit post is from Old Man. My job was to design and write software prototypes for individual high-value customers. If they liked it well enough, then a real software engineering team would build the real product. Occasionally, I would run the prototype for a few months while the customer evaluated if they wanted to buy the real project. Now, these prototypes don't take a lot of code, but they do run with a lot of data. Even compressed, it can be a terabyte or more. Having done this work for years, I've accumulated a small disk farm of past projects, which can be very useful when a customer asks for something just like we did last year, but with a small change or two. The company resisted buying me hard drives for this, but it saves me so much time, I ended up buying one or two a year myself until I accumulated about 10 of them. I figure that I've spent over $1,000 on external hard drives. Then, unexpectedly, management changes. The new management thinks that they can replace the old software guy with a cheaper new software grad and I'm laid off. And I have two weeks to train my replacement. Yes, it's blatant age discrimination, but it's impossible to fight. So, I just went for a graceful transition to my next job. Except, I have $1,000 of personal disk drives with old customer data on them. The company insists that no ex-employees may take any company data off-premises and all files must be deleted. I don't want to just leave the drives at the company, but they insist that I must delete all data before taking them home. So, I give them two options. One, they can buy the hard drives from me. Two, I can take them home because I'll eventually use them for something else, but I can leave the data on them in case someone else needs it. Nope, not good enough. The new manager insists that I must delete all data and all backups before I remove the drives. Okay, that's what I do. Six months later, I get a series of desperate phone calls. The new software grad has been unable to build any new prototypes. Old customers are calling to get old prototypes updated, and the new software grad has no idea how to do that. The executive VP is calling me to ask what would it take to bring me back to do my old job. Sorry, I've got a new job now. And even if I didn't, I can't just modify the old prototype because you insisted that I delete all copies of it. If I did want to modify it, I'd first have to recreate it from scratch. The code still exists in their source control, but the data is the heart of the prototypes. And all that data was deleted six months ago. Sorry, but you screwed yourselves exactly like I told you you would. I hope that whatever money you saved by hiring a new grad to replace an actual experienced programmer was worth it. Hello company, I'm your new manager, and as my first order of business, I'm gonna mess with the IT guy. Also, down in the comments, we have this story from Castor Navir. I had a similar experience while working as a contractor. I was brought in to work on an open source platform. Six months into the contract, they decide that we have to integrate with a certain device. I've never touched this type of device before, but I give it a try. Of course, we have no actual source control or documentation either. I try to talk to the guy who makes them, and he responds to a total of two emails over two weeks. After those two weeks, I get a call that I'm being let go from the contract because it's not a good sign that you can't get the development environment running. Never mind that I've single-handedly built 70% of their entire platform and demoed it to them three times along the way. So, after the call is over, they send me an email giving me parting instructions. And one of the steps on the list is to delete all the files related to my work immediately and that I have 24 hours to comply. Remember how I said that we have no source control? Well, I followed the instructions to the letter. I reformat the hard drive that I was keeping the project on. A week later, the project manager calls me up, telling me they have a new server and they need me to upload my code. I say, what are you talking about? You instructed me under threat of legal repercussions to delete those files last Tuesday. He just kind of sounds flabbergasted at that point. He tries to threaten me that he's not going to pay me for my last month of work. And I say, no, no, I have that time billed and labeled out for each thing that I did. 
It's not my responsibility to make sure that you have the deliverables that you explicitly instructed me to delete. I got my paycheck on time, and I never heard from them again. Then we have another similar story from Jippy Zippy Lippy. I had a similar thing happen with a small architect firm. I had my own design firm, and I'd been designing and updating their site for about five years. At the end of the final year, they told me that I was charging too much for any changes to the site, even though I'd given them tons of freebies. And they were going to get a younger, more hip designer that could do things faster and cheaper. They wanted me to give them all their files and delete what I had on my end. So, I sent them a CD with all of their files and erased everything, meaning that I erased all the code and all the build files for all the online images as well. I told them to put the CD in a safe place and make sure to back it up with another one. I closed out the account and moved on. About a year later, they called me in a panic saying that the new person screwed up their site. It wasn't running correctly and they couldn't find the CD I sent them. Apparently, they didn't make a backup. And somehow, this person also erased all the old files on their server as well, so they had nothing to start over with. Apparently, she was doing a redesign on the fly and just writing over the old files without backing anything up. But they didn't like her redesign and they wanted to put the old site back up until they could make a decision. But it was gone. Whoops. Not my problem. Get your younger, faster, hip designer to figure it out, folks. I'm out. Last time I checked, and this is years later, their old site is still up and still broken. So here's an idea, and I'm just, you know, throwing this out here as like a generic suggestion. Maybe, maybe don't mess with the IT guy. That was r slash malicious compliance, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.